Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. How does this work? Hey. Every disease is infectious unless proven otherwise. Already some of the other speakers have been talking about Professor Noel Rose from Johns Hopkins, uh, but also Yehuda Schoenfeld, another leading um, immunologist from um, Sheba in Israel, published a book um, in 2004 called Infection and, Inter and Autoimmunity, where they basically said the conclusion has to be that everything is infectious until proven otherwise. The problem was, in 2004, we didn't have the data that allowed us to identify the source of the infection. But now, we understand a lot more about the microbes that each one of us carries in our human bodies. And I'm not just talking about microbes in the gut or microbes in the mouth. We carry microbes in all our tissues. And uh, this particular article uh, in the eminent medical journal called The Economist, uh, this particular article uh, goes into detail that basically we now understand that man is a super organism. It's not just a single organism. We are made up of the interaction of a lot of organisms. And for approximately 25,000 human genes, there are more than a million microbial genes that have been identified to this point in time. So in 10 years, we've gone from not even realising that our blood was infected with uh, DNA from, uh, from microbes to suddenly realising that we are a super organism. And in fact, it turns out that the genetics plus the microbiome, the microbes in the body, uh, are what lead to disease. There's a very recent paper, October 24th, uh, which was published, I th think, in PLOS, uh, American Society of Human Genetics. Anyway, you can uh, chase it if you want to uh, get more details. But basically, there are strong correlations between the composition of the human microbiome and genetic variation in the immune-related pathways. So there's even crosstalk between the genetics that we get by sequencing and the microbes in our microbiome. And every one of us is unique. We accumulate microbes during life. So everyone in this room will have a different microbiome from the person sitting next to them. The study of the microbes is called metagenomics. <clears throat> so the obvious question is where do the microbes come from? Well, we are born with microbes. We are born with a full set of microbes for our gut, our GI tract. We are born with a full set of microbes for our oral, uh, mouth microbiomes, saliva. More than 600 species in a, a typical adult, healthy adult sub, uh, saliva. Um, and the best paper explaining some of this is from Dave Rillman's group at Stanford, which was published uh, just last month. Uh, and you can look that up if you like. Look, um, anybody that wants copies of these slides so that you can get the um, uh, citations, uh, just uh, email me or contact me afterwards and you can have the slides. <clears throat> and then after being born, we also get microbes from our mother's milk. The mother's milk contains more than 500 species of microbes. And the interesting thing is that when we plot the microbes out uh, in a special way so that the different species fall in different parts of the graph, the mother's milk is different from anything else in the body. We're not dealing with contamination of the mother's milk. These are different microbes which are only found in the mother's milk and presumably give some advantage to the uh, infant uh, in seeding the microbiome of the infant. And then we get, a, get uh, microbes from family and pets. There's a paper there if you want more detail. It's, I would have thought it's fairly obvious. But look, we also breathe air containing microbes. Now you can understand that when you're in a hospital that you would expect to have a fairly large uh, quantity of bacteria in the air, 86% in this study by the Craig Venter Institute. 
human, about 8% of the um, DNA in the air samples and everything else fairly small in a hospital. But look, in a house, a normal house, there is a similarly large quantity of bacteria in the air we breathe, bacterial DNA in the air we breathe. Uh, slightly less human and uh, d slightly different distribution, but there's not that much difference between the bacteria in the air in a hospital and the bacteria in the air in the house. We're exposed to it and our family is exposed to it. We also get microbes from the international transportation of food. When we eat meat from South America, that has got South American microbes in it and South American antibiotics usually. <laughs> and, and that also uh, helps the microbiome accumulate. And in fact, a very uh, elegant study uh, came out of Eric Elm's group at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, the citation is there down in the, the corner. And what they did was they showed that microbial species from food, and particularly from uh, both um, meat and grain products, could be found in the um, human genome of the people consuming that food. And what's particularly interesting is they were able to track the species by selecting microbes that had antibiotic resistant genes in them. So not only do we get the microbes from our food, we get nasty microbes from our food as well. <coughs> So where do these microbes live? Well, back in the 1980s, there was a group at Columbia University um, led by Imo Wirosko. And he did some uh, transmission electron microscopy of the cells, of the phagocytic cells from uh, patients who were ill. This one is from a patient with sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis patient. And you can see you've got about one quarter of the cell here. You've got a bit of nucleus, you've got the cytoplasm. It's a very highly magnified electron microscope image. But when they stained the sample with urinal acetate in order to uh, highlight the DNA samples, they found all these colonies of DNA from the microbes. This one is pretty obvious, that looks like a vacuole. But some of, these other colony, uh, some of these other colonies, although they're all protected by an exoskeleton, um, they're different shapes and different types of colonies, different communities that live inside the cells. And Wirosko's group was rather clever in that they extracted these phagocytes from the vitreous of the eye of patients so they didn't have a background to filter out in their microscopy. And um, a paper which just came out last week actually details what we think is happening. What we think is happening is that the macrophages, monocytes, and even the, the lymphocytes, as they tend to engulf the uh, bacteria, internalize the microbes, and then phagocytize, kill those microbes, that they internalize the microbes, but they fail to kill them. So you end up with communities inside a phagosome, vacuole phagosome, probably a phagosome that didn't work properly, and it's got a, a microbial community in it. There are other um, microbial staining around there as well. This is from um, a, a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patient, and it's a lymphocyte. And it's remarkably similar to the sarcoidosis macrophage that we saw in the last slide also from the Wirosko group, of course. <clears throat> well, I wanted to find out how microbes work at a level which is a lot smaller than an optical microscope can find, or even an electron microscope can find. I wanted to look at the molecules. So we had to use a new technology, um, which uh, actually this year was awarded the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry, we had to use a new technology which uses maths, physics and chemistry to emulate these uh, genomes, emulate the, the proteins uh, with a computer. And this is one of the things that we found. I was looking for a reason why uh, people were writing in papers 
that um, if you're studying the new uh, sartan drugs, you have to use an antimicrobial on the tissue before you put the sartan in, or you'll find that the sartan all collects in the micro. And I said to myself, why would a drug connect, collect in a micro? So I went looking for the target of that drug, which is the angiotensin II receptor in humans. And I found that in E. coli genome, there is a protein just called YDGG, which is identical, structurally identical. You can't tell the difference between them. There is some sequence difference, the aminos are slightly different, and that causes the drug to bind at a different position in the binding pocket, but the drug does bind in that gene from the um, uh, E. coli genome. This is molecular mimicry. You can imagine the trouble that the human body has when it is faced with a protein like this and it mistakes it for a protein like this. And another form of molecular mimicry is that many microbes have metabolisms that are similar to ours. E. coli, again, has got a glucose metabolism. And it starts out with glucose 6-phosphate, just as it does in a human, goes through fructose, a number of uh, uh, steps, just as in a human, and ends up with pyruvate, just as in a human. And the genes that allow it to go through these steps, very similar to human, steps, uh, the genes are also very similar to humans. It's a molecular mimicry by function rather than by pathogenicity or by uh, harm. <clears throat> and in order to treat patients, we really have to deal with the molecular mimicry as well as the inflammation. The inflammation uh, gives all the normal cytokine storm, but the molecular mimicry causes interactome damage, uh, damage to the way uh, our body metabolites interact with each other. Now, how much interactome damage is there? Well, this is a study which was made of multiple sclerosis patients, and for controls they used other, uh, other neurodegenerative diseases, and controls, healthy controls. And they took the proteome of the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and they, they selected about uh, three, 4,000 proteins to look at. And what they found was that in the multiple sclerosis case, uh, patients, there were 1,300 prote proteins that were unique to the multiple sclerosis uh, diagnosis. Other neurodegenerative diagnoses, there were about 1,500, 1,482 that were unique. And in healthy individuals, 633 that were unique. This is more than half of the total proteins in the CSF are changing in their expression markedly in a disease. So that just intercepting one pathway may not be enough. In fact, it almost certainly will not be enough. There are lots and lots of pathways, hundreds of pathways involved in chronic disease. And this uh, is a similar study with um, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, uh, Borreliosis, um, and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients, showing that there is a measurable difference between chronic fatigue syndrome patients, uh, PTLDS, uh, Lyme disease, um, post-treatment syndrome and uh, healthy individuals. A huge change in the way our body interacts um, when we have chronic disease. And we like to think of um, this area, the area of overlap here between the uh, diseases. We like to think of that as a comorbidity wheel where we put together the most common diagnoses that are related. For example, here is diabetes, here is asthma, and they're also related to rheumatoid arthritis. These are common comorbidities. We like to look at disease as a spectrum of disease from which diagnoses are made to describe specifics of a specific uh, individual uh, patient. But the, the disease itself is a spectrum. So, the microbes are not only in the gut, and the example I give there is Helicobacter pylori, which is also found 
in the peripheral blood and it's found in the plaque. Atherosclerotic plaque has microbes in it. It has about 80% of phagocytes, so if the phagocytes are infected, you'd expect uh, there to be infection within the plaque too. But um, a number of species have been isolated at this point, probably about a dozen major species from atherosclerotic plaque, and Helicobacter pylori is one of them. Um, Dave Rollman from Stanford first reported that there was microbial DNA in blood and then uh, also in amniotic fluid. Um, in fact, the changes in our gut, the changes in our GI tract, appear to be the result of the systemic microbiome changes and not necessarily the driving changes for the disease in the body. The important thing is that these genomes accumulate gradually during life we incrementally lose our ability to fight these microbes as more and more of them overcome our body. And it's the accumulated metagenome that determines whether we will be able to fight off an infection from tuberculosis or um, leprosy or whatever uh, infective agent comes along. That is why some people can not contract multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and other people very close to them do contract it because in one case the individual's body can help fight the uh, pathogen in the other case the body has been too weakened by the accumulated metagenome and it, what happens when cells get infected well this was a study that was done of uh, cells uh, in vitro that were infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis just a single pathogen, although a nasty one. <laughs> it's just a single pathogen, Mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. And they found that uh, there were at least 463 changes in the expression of the genes in that cell. And 97 of those changes were unknown. 97 of the metabolites that they found were unknown and presumably a result of the um, TB interacting with the uh, human uh, DNA inside the cell. And they affected all phases of the individual's body uh, activity. And the other well-known pathogens, uh, many of them also seem to go after this same pathway. There's a pathway which um, I should have noted on MTB, but it knocks down a nuclear receptor a nuclear receptor that generates thousands of genes and it knocks that down by 3.3 times and EBV knocks that down by 15 times in lymphoblastoid cell lines inside the bone marrow. It knocks down the ability of this VDR receptor to work by 15 times uh, in one and a half year old lymphoblastic cell lines. Okay. So, some of the microbes which have been confirmed to work on this VDR pathway at this point are uh, uh, MTB, of course, Aspergillus, Borrelia uh, bugdorferi, Chlamydia, um, Hepatitis C virus, Cytomegalovirus, and EBV. Most of, the, most of the pathogens that we find associated with chronic disease seem to work on this pathway. So I was very interested in looking more at this pathway. Uh, that was supposed to be a movie, but um, never mind. Uh, from our computer microscope, uh, we were able to use uh, these new technologies to simulate this VDR receptor and how it behaved uh, and why it was activated, which are these residues over here, the activation residues, and then how it behaves when it has a drug put in the binding pocket. And this particular drug uh, is a drug that was already available on the market used for high blood pressure, Olmosartan, and we found that it had a very high affinity for the VDR. So we changed the dosing from once every 24 hours to once every four hours, and we found that it activated the VDR, that it stimulates the innate immune system. And in fact, we've found over the last 10 years that stimulating the innate immune system does a marvelous job in dealing with chronic disease. And that's primarily, primarily because in human beings, not in mice, not in monkeys, 
Monkeys don't get HIV, monkeys succumb to SIV. Their immune systems are different. Mice immune systems are totally different. So um, only in man is this VDR nuclear receptor responsible for key intracellular defences and also key anti-cancer defence, incidentally. <clears throat> and what, our, uh, what the drug we found does uh, is when the normal activation of the VDR is knocked out, for example by gliotoxin from aspergillus, then the drug activates the VDR and allows the DNA to be uh, expressed correctly. And this is the change in pharmacokinetic profiles from the green, which is the dosing of the drug for uh, hypertension, uh, to the red, which is the concentration achieved with the dosing of the drug we use every four to six hours. <clears throat> So that's great. Um, we'd love to go to the patient important outcomes. We had to decide whether we were going to start studying the uh, mouse important outcomes first. In other words, could we study these diseases and this uh, discovery, this hypothesis, could we study that in mice? And the answer is no, we can't. Uh, Bruce Beutler, the uh, Nobel laureate, um, in uh, mouse genetics made it quite clear that the genomes of the two species are totally different uh, in the area of the uh, immune system. Different number of toll-like receptors and everything. So we went straight to uh, talking to uh, collaborating physicians. Actually that's not true. Collaborating physicians or the physicians were contacting us and saying how do we get involved and so we set up a collaborative network uh, all over the world and um, uh, we came up with a therapy using this drug as a monotherapy. No other drugs uh, are allowed with the exception of uh, painkillers, a few painkillers, but certainly not immunosuppressants. And the uh, vitamin D level in their blood had to be held at a very low level because we didn't want that interfering with the uh, internal operation of the cell. Vitamin D in the blood interferes with the operation in the cell. I'm not going to go into that, it's a whole lecture in, in, in and of itself. But it's bad for you. So they, that, all of these uh, patients have been uh, very low levels of vitamin D. Nothing wrong with their skeletons. Uh, osteoporosis doesn't exist. And uh, they have nice strong skeletons even after 10 years with no vitamin D. And the therapy didn't have to be personalised. And uh, my colleague Tom Perez, who spent 25 years at the FDA, uh, reported that out of 100 patients that uh, he uh, and uh, Joyce Waterhouse sorted through the data on, that just about all of them were responding well. Didn't matter whether the diagnosis was rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, sarcoidosis, CFS. After about three years of treatment, 81% reported reduced disease and symptoms. And then my uh, collaborators, this is uh, Greg Blaney from Canada, uh, made reports at uh, the Autoimmunity Congress, um, this one in 2008, on patients that were being treated uh, and how they responded. I'll skip through these. Uh, just last year, um, a colleague from Norway, Inga Lindseth, uh, gave a case series of 64 patients uh, with a CFS diagnosis that uh, had been treated. And the interesting thing is the end point is return to work. Our goal is return to work, not palliation of symptoms, uh, reversal of the disease process. And uh, Dr. Roswitha Goetzapelka from Berlin found that with a sarcoidosis patient that recovered and a multiple sclerosis patient, both of them had um, uh, psychiatric uh, issues, paresthesia, cognitive and memory difficulties. And the psychiatric manifestations disappeared as the sarcoidosis disappeared, the sarcoid inflammation disappeared, and the MS, um, neurodegenerative disease, started to normalise. So there is a problem. The problem is that when you kill the microbes, you will cause some damage to the rest of the body. It's immunopathology. Uh, we've written a paper on this, it's cited at the bottom, so I won't go into detail, but this is a sarcoidosis patient 
who was treated for six years, or this shows six years of his treatment. Um, he was actually being treated at the um, uh, Naval Be uh, Bethesda Medical uh, Hospital. So, summary. The human microbiome causes changes to the interactome inside phagocytic cells, causing dysfunction in the cell metabolism, which we know as, in this case, autoimmune disease, because that's been our biggest focus, but chronic disease in general. And our clinical collaborators have demonstrated proof of concept with more than a decade of uh, observational data they obtained from treating a variety of difficult diagnoses. Um, now, the relevance to PPPM is that once we understand what causes the disease, we can then put steps in place to uh, prevent the microbiome from overwhelming an individual. We can look at the diet, we can look at the South American beef. Uh, those issues can be looked at once we've got the pathogenesis in place. Um, and it's almost too late. 49% of US adults have at least one chronic disease and 25% of US adults have two or more comorbid chronic diagnoses. And that makes them more susceptible to cancer. Uh, there is about half the survival rate from cancer when a patient has three um, inflammatory comorbidities. This is a new paper just out in uh, November. So uh, production, prediction and prevention are the two Ps from PPPM that I focus on, not the personalization. Prediction, what causes the disease, uh, and prevention, how can we uh, stop or slow that disease process. Thank you very much. Thank you.